And I'm going to jump right in. If you have your Bibles, let's go to uh, the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 21. And uh, I know it's Easter, and um, God willing, I'm going to make this all make sense before our time together is over. Numbers chapter 21, starting at verse number 4. If you don't have your Bibles, we'll put it on the screen to our sides. But uh, if you have your Bible, flip there. Numbers is in the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 21, starting at verse number 4. 4 says this, the Israelites left Mount Hor by the road that leads to the Gulf of Aqaba uh, in order to go around the territory of Edom. But on the way, the people lost their patience and spoke against God and spoke against Moses. For they complained, why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in this desert where there is no food and there is no water? We can't stand any more of this miserable food. For then the Lord sent, check this, then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people and many Israelites were bitten and died for the people came to Moses and said we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you now pray to the Lord to take these snakes away so Moses prayed for the people and then the Lord told Moses to make a metal snake and put it on a pole so that anyone who was bitten could look at it and be healed so Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole, and anyone who had been bitten would look at the bronze snake, and they would be healed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Bible. God, we thank you, Lord, that when we read it, it is nourishment for our soul. God, I pray that we take this Old Testament story, and God, that you use it to preach the gospel. Lord, that many people today would return to you, And find you, God, that today, Lord, there would be a party in heaven because of what takes place in this room. And God, we thank you in advance for every life you'll change and every life you'll touch. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask it. And everybody says amen and amen. If you're taking notes, I've tagged the title today, Mercy of the Metal Snake. Mercy of the Metal Snake. I think it was Charles Dickens who once said, that it was uh, the best of times, but it was also the worst of times. I think if you would study the children of Israel's life and you would would, would know their their, their journey that they've been on, I believe uh, this would almost be their motto of what they experienced in their life. Like it was the best of times, but it was also the worst of times. They, they, they saw some amazing things that God did. They seen God's provision. They seen God's obedience. Uh, they, they saw God do amazing things, and they, they would say, yeah, it was, the, it was the best of times, but it was also the worst of times. And the things they didn't see wasn't God's fault. If you study, if you study the Bible, you'll realize everything they didn't have wasn't because of, of God's faithfulness. It was because of their lack of obedience. And I think it's important to understand that in our life, there will be great times and there will be not so great times. In our faith journey as a Christ follower, as a Christian, uh, there will be times where it's awesome and it's easy and it's fun, but it'll be awesome and good. And then there are other times as a Christian where it's hard, it's difficult. We go through difficult trials and circumstances and mountaintops and valleys. And, and then outside of the Christian faith and just the world that we live in, if you don't even know Jesus, there are great times in your life. There are great seasons in your life. There are times where life is awesome and life is fun, and then there are also times uh, where life's not fun and life life is hard. And I think we all could relate a little bit, especially in these last three years, that sometimes it was the best of times, and then also it was the worst of times. And I just come to encourage you, no matter where you find yourself at, in this spectrum of faith or in this spectrum of life, if you find yourself inside of the kingdom of God or outside of the kingdom of God, if you find yourself as a Christ follower or you find yourself not as a Christ follower, I've come with good news for you today that Jesus loves you and that Jesus has a plan for your life. (laughs) 
even when it doesn't make sense, even when, we're, even when, when it's painful, even, even in our suffering, even when we look at the crazy world we're living in and the crazy things that are happening in our society and crazy things that are happening in our school systems and the crazy things that are happening in our family. I'm talking about in spite of all of those things on the outside, God is still faithful to us, God still loves us, and God still has a plan for us. I love it like King David said in the book of Psalms that I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise will forever be on my lips. So what King David was saying basically was in the good times I'm going to praise him. And in the bad times I'm going to praise him. When things are going great I'm going to praise him. And when things aren't going so great I'm going to praise him. In the great times I'm going to praise him. And in the low times, I'm going to praise him. When I get the good report, I'm going to praise him. But when I get the bad report, I'm going to praise him. When I get the blessing, I'm going to praise him. But when the blessing passes me by, I'm going to praise him. What King David was saying, I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. I love the Bible. I love, I, I love the, whole, the whole Bible. But the older I get, the more I love to preach from the Old Testament. And what I've learned by studying the Bible is that Cover to cover, front to back, Genesis to Revelation, this Bible, the thing that we hold sacred, all this Bible from the front to the back is one big honking neon sign pointing you and I to our coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Everywhere in the book you read it. Everywhere that every story that you read, when, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, Jesus was the covering that covered their nakedness. Jesus was in the book of Genesis. Jesus was Moses, our deliverer. Jesus was David, the giant killer. I'm not talking about a seven or nine foot tall giant, but I'm talking about Jesus killing the giant of sin in our life. And over and over in the Old Testament, he was the ram in the thicket. He was the manna that fell from heaven. He was the raven who fed Elijah. He was the one who wrestled with Jacob in the desert. He was the wall that held up the Red Sea of the water. He was the burning bush. He was the dominant lion. He was the fourth man in the fiery furnace. I'm coming to tell you, this whole entire book is a sign pointing to our coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so I, I love, I love, I was going to preach a message uh, this, this, this Easter, two sticks and one stone, and talk all about David and Goliath and how David took two sticks and one stone and conquered the giant and slayed the giant. And it, what, do you think it really is just two sticks and one stone in the Old Testament? No, two sticks and one stone pointed to, to the cross and the grave. And it only took two sticks to make a cross and one stone to cover the grave. And just as David defeated the giant back then, Jesus defeated the giant of sin in his day. And so the whole entire book is pointing you and I to our, our coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, it's not in the form of what we, we want God to do, but it always comes in the form of what we need God to do. He's always providing exactly what we need when we need it. As a matter of fact, he can't do anything but provide for his children. That's why we call him Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And I feel like today we're, we're, we're seeing him provide in ways, in supernatural ways, and if you're not looking, you're, you're going to miss it because it may not be coming in the form of how you think it's coming. But it's here. And God is providing and God is moving. As a matter of fact, I think, I think, I, I think this, this coming year will be the most significant, significant year in God's church that this world has ever seen. When, 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 you, when you see a world preaching hopeless, when you, when you see a world prescribing people that you have no hope and there is no hope, that you don't need to hope for anything, that, that's what we face in our world today, that society and culture and, and news channels and uh, our government, they, they want to they prescribe this thing, that there is no hope for humanity. And if you have a life today with no hope, that's your option, not your story. Hope is not based on a feeling. Hope is a person. And the world may not have the hope, but the church has the hope. Jesus himself said, I am the hope of the world. Like Jesus came and said, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing hope. There's hope today for you. 
Like, we're, we're not hopeless in America today. We're not hopeless in our families today. We're not hopeless in God's church today. No, hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. And even though we might struggle, and even though we might hurt, we still have hope, and we still have his name, and we still have his presence. If you're taking notes, write this down. Every situation and circumstance that you face in your life can give you revelation. Simply put, behind every situation is a God revelation. Every situation that I have personally faced and walked through and came through, I have gained a significant revelation about who my God is. Because I now know, because of where I've been and what i faced and what I've been able to overcome, that my God is good. That he does good. He can do nothing but be good. That he is always with me. That he's never left me that he guides me, that he fills me, that he has a purpose for me, that he has a plan for me, that he loves me, that he sustains me, that he provides for me, that he graces me, and he favors me, and he loves me, and he chases me. And so no matter what I face, and I've come to encourage you, no matter what you face or what you walk through, I want to remind you about what I've come to know, not what I see, not what I feel, Not what other people have said, but I've come to tell you what I know to be true, that my God is faithful. I know that my God is good. I know that my God is still a healer. I know that my God is still my provider. I know that God is well able. I know that God can do all things. I know God can make all things new. I know God is my savior and my redeemer, and he has a way of taking all of the things the enemy meant for evil and scoop it up and begin to work it. The Bible says he works all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And so if you're not seeing good, then God ain't done working the bad yet. If you, if you ain't got to the good place yet, then you've got to give God time to keep working because the Bible promises us that he works all things. Every season. No matter how bad it may seem to you, just give God time to work it. So I came with good news today. You won't catch this on CNN. You won't catch it on Fox News. You won't, definitely won't catch it on MSNBC. But I'm coming with some good news for your life today. That no matter where you are, and no matter what you've done, our God is not mad at you. Our God is not angry at you. Our God does not have a vicious hammer ready to hit you over the head every time you fail. No, I've come with good news. There's not one person in this room or watching me online today that has done anything too bad or too far that God's grace can't reach, that his blood won't cover. There's not one sin too great. There's not one person too lost that my God can't save and my God cannot redeem. Come on, he loves you today. The message of Christianity, the message of Easter, the message of God's church is victory. Come on, it's not weakness. It's definitely not wokeness. It's strength and it's victory. It's not being passive. Now, the message of the church is we serve a champion, we serve a king who sits on a throne. He was never voted in, and we cannot vote him out. And he sits with total authority, and he knows the beginning from the end. Come on, the message of God's church. Come on, it's victory. Make no mistake about it. We have all, been, been, we have, we have all benefited from the finished work of Jesus Christ. We're all benefactors means we get to receive something that we didn't really deserve to be in on. And we're all today in the room benefactors of Jesus' finished work on the cross. His shed blood, we're, we're a, we, we are a benefactor because of Jesus shedding his blood on the cross that covers my sin debt and covers your sin debt. That we couldn't pay it for ourselves, and so Jesus paid it for us. So we've all been, we've all benefited Not by what we can do, but we benefit because of what's already been done. 
And if we're honest, there's all across this room, if we could just really be honest for a few minutes, we all found ourselves in a time or two falling, messy, dirty, come on, doing, doing something that we didn't want to do, but we did it. Why is it that we don't do the things that we want to do? And the things we want to do, we never get around to doing. Because we don't need help today doing the wrong thing. You don't need me to teach you how to do the wrong thing. It comes natural to us. But what God's people needs is to be taught how to do the right thing. How many parents are in the room? Married, 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 married people in the room. Yeah, yeah. It's one thing when we have to clean up a mess that we make. But, but what's it like to go through something when you have to clean up a mess that somebody else makes? Like wives, when you got to pick your skanky drawers of your husband off the couch. <laughs> and they've been laying there for four days. To have, he hasn't changed them in seven months. And you just... It doesn't even move. It's just stiff as a board. <laughs> or ladies, you go in to pee and your husband came in before you and didn't lift the seat. And you were greeted by a wet sensation on your thighs. And now you're forced to clean up a mess that you didn't even make. I heard a friend of mine he uh, was preparing his message on the weekend, and uh, he, had, he had some kids and parents. We can relate, but th- he, was, he was sitting at the kitchen table, and he was preparing the sermon, and his, his kids were playing in the, in the back room. And, you know, you, parents, when you hear noise, it's a good thing, but when things go silent, something's happened. And so he was telling me, he said, things got real quiet. And then all of a sudden, he said, one of his kids came walking down the hallway, and and he was walking like this, underwear around his ankles. And he says this to his dad, Dad, I think I pooped my pants. (laughs) Now, at this stage of the game, that's not something that you think happened. Pretty good idea you know if you pooped your pants. And so the dad said, well, let's just figure this thing out. The dad took a couple steps, and without a doubt, he said the smell hit him and said, yes, you have indeed pooped your pants. And so he did what every trophy husband would do. He took his child into the bathroom and got him into the bathroom and getting ready to clean him up and then yelled for his wife, hey, babe, we got a mess that needs cleaned up. And he said one of the most profound things about what happened with his child was it was, on the way, it was on his way to church, and so he made a mess while he had his church clothes on. And I think sometimes we come in looking good because we got our church clothes on, but you got a mess inside of you. You got a mess in your life. You got a mess in your family. You got a mess up in your marriage. You got a mess up in your finances. And the danger is we can come on the outside with our church clothes on thinking that we're good and thinking that we're worthy. But meanwhile, we're walking around with stains on our life and stench in our life and dirtiness in our life. And I've come to tell you, if we don't get honest, then we cannot get help. But if you get honest, you can get help. What are you trying to say? I'm saying you can, you can keep your sin and you can keep your mess and you can keep your dirt for the rest of your life and keep it to yourself and you'll get no help for it. But the Bible says it this way, that everyone who calls for help gets it. And so if we want help for our life, if we want help for our mess, if we want, if we want help for the sin in our life, I'm just telling you, like, there's a time where we have to come to to get real and to get honest in front of God because newsflash, he already knows the mess that you're carrying around. And so just like this kid had an accident, we too have had an accident. And if we don't get honest... And we know we can't get help. 
the thing that was really profound about the story is he said, you know, he said, really, he said, you think when you, your, your child does that as their father, a lot of times you think because you've messed up, your father doesn't love you like he should. But he said, what happened in this case that I saw my child in such shame and such despair because he was embarrassed and ashamed that he made the mess. But, he, but, but here's, here's what the dad said. Here's what the dad said. He said, but it made me have compassion on my child even more. It made, me com- it made me have empathy for my child even more. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm, I'm trying to tell you that just because you've had an accident or just because you're living a life of sin doesn't mean that our God does not love you today. Doesn't mean he doesn't have compassion for you today. But I would say as a matter of fact, his, his mercy and his compassion is as big as it's ever been for your life. And if we really want to get help, I'm just coming to tell you, admitting that you have a mess that needs cleaned up is the first place to start. For we've all fallen short. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So I love the story of the day. In Numbers chapter 21, Moses was just leading them out of Egypt and trying to get them into the promised land. And I mean, Moses was leading one one million plus people. Like this wasn't just a group of 50 people or a group of 150 people. It was by the millions. He was leading these millions of people out of the hand of the Pharaoh, out of the hand of bondage, out of the hand of slavery, out of the hand of, of, of working for the man every day and sweating and eating onions and leeks and garlic. And, and Moses was the, was the great deliverer and he was delivering his people out of the hand of Pharaoh. And all these people did was grumble and complain about the journey they're on. These people saw miracles happen daily. Miracles happen in front of their eyes where daily they were led by a cloud. And at night, they were led by a pillar of fire. These same people that grumbled and complained, they had seen the Red Sea parted. They had saw Pharaoh's army chasing them down and the sea swallow them up and the wheels of their chariots be locked up. They have seen God perform miracle after miracle. They saw their leader Moses go to the high mountain and receive the Ten Commandments and meet with God. They saw the glory settle on the mountaintop. They saw all these amazing things, but yet on the journey they were on, they found themselves grumbling and complaining. They were fed manna from heaven. And like I said earlier, manna, when they rejected the manna, Jesus was the manna. Jesus was the bread that came from heaven to feed them in the wilderness. Symbolizing you and I being feeding on the bread of life in, in the wilderness or in the desert or in Egypt, a place called sin. And when they rejected the manna, it was symbolic of the world rejecting Jesus Christ and putting him on the cross. And we find them, Moses leading them to to the land and decided to take a shortcut. And Moses knew it wasn't a shortcut. He was taking a long way around. And these people became agitated. They started cursing Moses. They started cursing God. They started grumbling. They started complaining. And all of a sudden, God said, that's it. I've had enough. And the Bible says that he sent poisonous snakes into the camp. And if you study it, for every snake they would kill, ten more would hatch. God was trying to get their attention. Hey, I've been so good to you. I've been so faithful to you. I have, made, I, have, I, I have given you meals. I have given you manna. You complained about manna, so I sent a bunch of birds into your camp, and that wasn't good enough for you either. And I've had enough of your complaining, and so he sent poisonous snakes into the camp. And the Bible says it began in killing people in the camp to the place where finally their eyes were opened that, man, we should not have cursed against God and we shouldn't have cursed against Moses. And they go to their leader and they say, Moses, would, would you cry out to God? Would you, would, you, would you seek God and have him come and do something miraculous? And, and God gave Moses this crazy, crazy story, this crazy idea. He said, Moses, I need you to make a metal snake. 
I need you to take a piece of bronze, and I need you to, I need you to form it into a metal snake. And, and so Moses, Moses followed God. One thing I love about Moses is he never doubted when God said to do something. He always followed it immediately. And so Moses went to work, and he began to form that metal snake, and he began to, to finish the work that God told him to finish. He said, once you make that metal snake, hang it on a pole and take it out and hoist it in the air. And if the people that were bitten would look upon that snake, gaze upon that snake. In the Hebrew, when they say gaze, it means look at and believe in. If they would look at and believe in that metal snake that's hoisted on the stick, they would be healed. Preacher, what's that got to do with Easter? Everything. He that knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of Christ. In, in John chapter 3, we see Jesus saying this. He, he, he says that just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so has the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but would have eternal life. And just as the Israelites looked to a snake on a pole for healing from the poisonous venom, we get to look to the Savior on the cross to heal us from the poison of sin. Come on, we've all been bitten today by the sin virus. We've all been, we've all been infected by the sin virus. And we cannot work our way to get good. We cannot work to get that sin venom out of our life. It only comes by a blood transfusion. And so when the Bible says that he, he that knew no sin became sin and the Son of Man be lifted up, when, when, when Jesus was on the cross and they said the whole weight of the world's sin was upon his shoulders, it was a story pointing back to Moses as he lifted up the metal snake in the wilderness that if we would just gaze upon the Son of Man, the Son of God hanging on the cross, if we would just get our eyes on him, and not just notice him, but we got to do what the Hebrew says. we got to believe in him. That as he hung there and, they, and he breathed and he suffered, and the blood began to run out of his hands and run out of his feet and out of his side and down his face. Jesus was a finisher, baby. And as he, as he hung there, we didn't need a lot of his blood. We just needed one drop of his blood. And the only way we get remedy for the sin in our life is when we gaze upon the sun. The mercy of the metal snake was just a big honking story sign of the sacrifice that Jesus was making for us. Judgment and mercy. Jesus did both on the cross. When he took the sin in my life and in your life and in your life upon his shoulders, he took the judgment that was meant for me and meant for you. And not only did he judge us, but he promised us mercy holding back what we deserve and then gives us grace the thing that we don't deserve so we've all have a sin debt today i've got a sin debt today i'm not on a platform preaching down to you i'm in the seat beside of you preaching to myself that I don't care how, how far you've ran, how many sins in your life, how many bad things, how many women you slept with, how many times you got drunk, how addicted to the bottle you are, how many drugs you took, how many people you wronged, how many bad words you said, how much unforgiveness is in your heart. I'm telling you, all you have to do today is look and gaze upon the sun. The finished work of the cross. And the thing about our faith is you can look at the cross and he ain't there. You can go to the tomb today, and he ain't there. 
He not only started it, but he finished it. And because of the finished work of our Savior Jesus Christ, you and I get to tap into a life we don't deserve. We get to live a life that we do not deserve. Jesus paid the bill that we couldn't afford to pay with his grace and his mercy and his precious blood that was shed upon the cross that day. Come on, the mercy of the metal snake.